All right, so here we go into the grand experiment. This is Unit 1, Day 1 for AP Calculus BC. And we spend most of the first couple of weeks looking at some pre-calculus stuff, stuff that you're going to need to remember, stuff that I'm going to need to remind you about so that we can, we, we can get stuff done. All right, so let's get into some content. Uh, and let's start out with everything you need to know about lines. Let's start with that. So things we have to know. We have to know how to find slope. We have to know that it is abbreviated M for slope. We have to know that it's the change in Y over the change in X. We have to know that that's the change in Y over the change in X. Those are things we have to know. The idea of slope comes back over and over and over again in the calculus because if you remember correctly, calculus is about the slopes of curvy things. So um, if you're trying to sound smart at a math party, the delta y and the delta x are called increments. Increments, uh, incremental steps are little steps, and so the delta y, the delta x, small changes in y, small changes in x. Um, things you need to know. If a line is horizontal, its slope is zero. If a line is vertical, its slope is undefined. This is very straightforward. If I have a horizontal line, the change in y is 0, 0 over some number that we don't care about. If I have a vertical line, then the change in y is some number, but the change in x is 0. 0 can be divided by a number. That gives a real answer. That real answer is 0. But you cannot divide a non-zero number by zero. That's all sorts of trouble. Uh, if two lines are parallel, they have the same slope. If two lines are perpendicular, then the slope of one is the opposite reciprocal of the slope of the other. Uh, sometimes, in fact, the way this gets remembered is that the product of the slopes is negative one. Sometimes it's easier to figure things out that way. Oh, we gotta go other side. Golly gee. Okay, so extend page. Uh, the point slope equation of a line comes back over and over and over again because when we write equations of tangent lines, we have a point, we have a slope, we use them. So the equation of a line in point slope form is that y minus y1 is slope times x minus x1. That is a big, big deal. This is something that you want to have in your memory banks point slope equation of a line. You are free to use y equals mx plus b. Uh, you won't be penalized for using y equals mx plus b, but it takes longer. So the penalty is your own time. Um, if you want to use slope intercept, if you want to use y equals mx plus b, you are free to do so. If I give you a line in y equals mx plus b form, you've got to come up with slope and y-intercept. Um, I'll file this away. In general, a general linear equation can be expressed in the form ax plus by equals c, where a and b are not both zero. Uh, clearly, if a and b are both zero, that's not much of an equation. But if a and b are not both zero, this is the general linear equation. The trick here is that this can be used for any line. It can be used for any line. Uh, y equals mx plus b is great. Point slope equation is great because they represent all non-vertical lines. But if your line is vertical, it's got the equation x equals blah bitty blah, then just by setting b equal to zero, you get a you get the equation of a vertical line. So the general equation works for all lines, even the vertical ones. All right. Next. Everything you need about 
functions. Everything you have to remember about functions. Um, I'm going to give you a quick definition. A function from a set D to a set R is a rule that assigns a unique element in R to each element in D. A unique element in R to each element in D. Um, I have to pause for a moment and just be just be a teacher because uh, this is a semi big deal. Vocabulary. D is called the domain. It's the set of all X values, first values, you name it. The set R is the codomain. The codomain is the set that contains the range. It is not the range. It is the codomain. So I'll get all highfalutin intellectual with you. Uh, let's assume that we take the function x squared. It maps from the reals to the reals. But not all of the reals get mapped to. For example, negative 3 doesn't get mapped to. So all real numbers is the codomain. The range is a piece of that. It's the non-negative real numbers. Uh, it's a finer point. You'll pick it up in intro to proof somewhere in college if you go through math. So there. So let's see. Uh, nobody really cares about codomain. Uh, people really care about the range. They really don't give a rip about codomain. And so we don't say find the domain and the codomain. We say find the domain and the range because the codomain is determined uh, on a situation by situation basis. But the range is determined by the function itself. Uh, oh, we'll play that game in a moment. Um, a function is a rule. Usually that rule is algebraic. It doesn't have to be. It can be verbal. It can be tabular. It can be all sorts of things. Uh, but it's a rule. It is a mechanism by which every element in D gets mapped to a unique element in R. And that's why the vertical line test holds true. If I can draw a vertical line that hits a graph twice, then there's one element in D going to more than one element in R. You can find them just by following the vertical line and seeing every place that hits the graph. Uniqueness is a big deal in that definition of function. Okay, so find domain and range. Well, that shouldn't be too hard. Here's a picture for you. Uh, this is the picture of y equals 1 over x squared, which is one of those things we have stuck in our memory bank somewhere. Uh, how do I find domain and range? Well, the domain is a set of all the x values, and that's, of course, everybody except for 0. Uh, you're free to write that using set builder notation. Nobody does, but you're free to write things that way. Uh, range, again, we imagine the chicken shining the flashlight from infinity, and we see where the shadow is cast on the vertical axis. That gives us the range. That lets the sun shine in, and so we've got all positive real numbers. Uh, likewise, y equals square root 9 minus x squared. Square root of 9 minus x squared. Well, how does that work? Well, I don't know what that looks like in general, but I bet you if I squared both sides and then I kicked that over, you would see that this is part of a circle. It's part of a circle whose center is at the origin, whose radius is 3. Uh, specifically, it's the top half of the circle because otherwise we would expect a plus or minus there. But that's not what we have. We don't have a plus or minus there. And so we get the top half of the circle looks like that. And since it's the top half of the circle, Standard at the origin with radius of 3, this runs from negative 3 to 3, that's 3 up top, and so the domain runs from negative 3 to 3. Remember the square brackets are there to indicate that negative 3 and 3 are included. The range runs from 0 to 3. Excellent. Uh, ooh, more things you should know. 
more things you should know. A couple things. Even functions. Even functions have y-axis symmetry. For an even function, f of negative x is the same as f of x. It's a definition you've got to file away. You want to file it away in function form and in geometric transformational symmetry form. Odd functions have origin symmetry. For odd functions, f of negative x is the same as negative f of x. You will remember even functions, things like that, f of 2, f of negative 2, same deal. f of 1, f of negative 1, same deal. For odd functions, you will envision things like x cubed, where f of 2 and f of negative 2 are equal with opposite sign. Those are things that we should remember. Um, one more thing we should remember. Uh, let's see. What if I want to sketch y equals absolute value of x minus 2 minus 1? absolute value of x minus 2 minus 1. Well, we know that the absolute value graph is a physical function. Everybody model. Everybody. Very good. That's a physical function. And so we've got to break down what we're doing to it. The x minus 2 means we're moving to the right 2 from the standard position, from the parent function. And that minus 1 means we're moving down 1. This is everything we learned in IB unit 1 right off the bat at the start of the year. And so we're going to move over 2 and down 1. And we're going to have a vertex at 2, negative 1. And that's how we do it. We just draw the graph in the spot we anticipate. Excellent. Thing three you're supposed to know. You're supposed to know everything you need about exponential functions. Exponential functions. That is a huge deal. So let's see. Everything we're supposed to remember. We're supposed to remember that this function looks like so. And, and then, then this function looks like so. And then this function looks like so. So what are they? Well, let's pretend that the red function is y equals 2 to the x, and the green function is y equals 3 to the x, and the blue function is y equals 5 to the x. Those are rough sketches of 2 to the x, 3 to the x, and 5 to the x. You will notice several things. You will notice that each of those functions goes through the point 0, 1, because exponential functions always go through 0, 1. You will notice that on the right side of the y-axis, 5 to the x is on top of 3 to the x is on top of 2 to the x, which sort of makes sense. On the left side of the y-axis, you will notice that 2 to the x is on top of 3 to the x is on top of 5 to the x, and that makes sense if you think about it, but this is school, so we don't think. Uh, you will also notice that the graphs are increasing on their entire domain and that they are concave up on their entire domain, which just means that they are increasing at an increasing rate. Um, ooh, side note, la y equals e to the x is somewhere in between y equals 2 to the x and y equals 3 to the x because e is approximately 2.718281828459045 approximately. So if you really want to impress that special someone at a math party, how does that work? You memorize 2.7, then you've got 1828 and 1828 repeating, and then 459045, every mathematician's favorite triangle. And so you can commit that to memory without too much trouble at all. I would try it at a party sometime. Excellent. So those are the highlights from lesson one. Um, you should also review all of your laws of exponents because you're going to need your laws of exponents. Uh, but I, I think that those are the big pieces, and I hope that that will help you to get homework one all set. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow.